Hello, I'm Mrs. Abby. I'm your language arts teacher. And today we read a book. It was called 30 Minutes Over Oregon. Now remember, this week we're talking about conflict resolution. And this is a really good book about a war that happened during, or a, an event that happened um, in World War II. And as you can see, there's a plane on the front of the cover. This is a Japanese bomber. And one of the things that I think all of us can agree on is that when we read a book about war, one of the things that we expect in the book would be to hear about bombing and destruction. We typically wouldn't hear about peace and, and people making friendships, would we? Well, 30 Minutes Over Oregon is by Mark Taylor Nobleman. It's a war story. It's nonfiction, which, as you know, that means this is a true story. But this is a war story with a twist also. What you expected might not be what you get. I'll start with the prologue. Remember, a prologue is at the beginning of a story, and it gives us a little bit of background information about what the story is about. <clears throat> prologue. On December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, an American naval base on Hawaii. The surprise attack killed thousands of soldiers and brought Americans into World War II. To re retaliate, the U.S. bombed Tokyo from the sky. This became known as the Doolittle Raid, which would later be memorialized in both a book and a film called 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. In response, Japan set out to prove that continental America, though far from all World War II combat, could also be bombed. This is the story of what happened next. <clears throat> Fifteen miles off the Oregon coast on September 9, 1942, Nobuo Fujito strode across the slippery deck of a submarine. He gripped the 400-year-old samurai sword that had been in his family for generations. Come on, he told his navigator. It will soon be sunup. They climbed into a small plane that was about to be launched by catapult toward the United States. You can see his samurai sword there that he's carrying. But isn't that really awesome that they could carry planes on a submarine? As he did before every flight, Nobuo strapped the sword to his set seat for luck. Crew members loaded 168-pound bombs under each wing of the plane. The Japanese hoped that the bombs would start a fire that would consume the Oregon woods, then rage into nearby towns and cities. Don't tell anyone, Nobuo's commander had told him, not even your wife. So instead of sharing with Akeo what the Japanese had entrusted him to do, Nobuo left strands of hair and fingernail clippings for her, for her to bury if he didn't make it back. If the American military shot at him, his plane would not be fast enough to evade being hit. The catapult flung the plane off the sub with a hard whoosh. All right, so this catapult, catapults are a mechanism that slings something forward, sort of like a slingshot. But I found this to be really interesting, okay, that the Japanese military told him not to tell even his wife, and Nobuo followed those commands. Think about the fact that he was still afraid that he might be killed in this attack because he collected strands of his hair and his fingernail clippings just in case he didn't make it back, his wife would have some part of his body to bury. Steering into the rising sun, Nabuo scanned the sky for American fighters but saw no one. When he flew over the tiny town of Brookings, Oregon, some of the residents heard the motor. A few saw the plane puttering through the fog, but almost none suspected it was an enemy aircraft. So life was just going on as normal there. You should take a moment to look and see where Oregon is in the United States.
Shortly after 6 a.m., high above the thick wooded mountains, nine miles east of Brookings, Nabuo gave his navigator the order, the bombs are to be dropped here. Nabuo wheeled the plane over his shoulder. He caught sight of a white flash below. He beelined back to the ocean, flying low enough to clip the treetops. He landed on the water, and the sub crew hoisted the plane about aboard with a crane. They quickly removed the wings and floats and stowed everything in a watertight, watertight hangar. The su sub then dove 250 feet. Meanwhile, the forest was burning just a bit. Only one of the two bombs had exploded. Two uh, spar exploded, sparking patches of fire that didn't spread. The ground was too damp from recent rain. The other bomb had buried itself on impact without a trace. Four men from the forest lookout station spotted smoke and trudged several hours to the remote site and extinguished the flames. They figured the fire was caused by lightning, but they noticed a splintered tree and beneath it a small pit in a circle of scorched earth. Widening the pit into a crater, they uncovered metal fragments. Some had markings in Japanese. The news that, for, uh, that a foreign foe had flown in and out of American airspace undetected zipped through Brookings. Townsfolk were shaken, but many were more concerned for their relatives fighting overseas. Several newspapers put, put forth the notion that the plane may have taken off from a sub but this was dismissed as impossible or improbable. The military assumed that the incident was isolated and did little to increase their efforts to defend the coast. You know, it was just too unbelievable that this happened, wasn't it? 20 days after the bombing, Nabuo did it again. Same plan, same plane. All right, what do you think about the attitudes toward the bombing? Okay, uh, the, the attitude I see is that the townspeople and, and most everybody else in America just went on with normal life. They didn't really think it was that big of a deal. I guess maybe since it didn't do much damage and not many people had seen it and it didn't, it didn't send a rush of fear out among many Americans, did it? Okay? Only that time, for great, greater stealth, he went by night. To protect coastal communities from becoming easy targets, the U.S. military routinely ordered blackouts during the war, but the lighthouse at Cape Blanco remained lit and guided to shore by its beam, Nabuo headed to a wooded area north of Brookings and dropped two more bombs on Oregon. On his return, Nabuo could not locate the sub. Nearly out of fuel, he resigned himself to dying with honor by winging back and crashing into the lighthouse. Now, one of my students pointed out um, today that this is called a kamikaze pilot because they're willing to die um, for the sake of helping their country win the war. So he's a kamikaze pilot. The mission comes first, the sub next, he said to his navigator. We come last. But a moment later, he glimpsed a dark, snaky shimmer on the ocean swell, an oil leak from his sub. The Japanese believed the second two bombs had detonate, detonated. Americans scoured the woods but found no fragments and no damage. Or if they did, they kept quiet about it. Either way, Japan clam claimed both invasions as victories. They had caught American, America off guard. After years at war, Naburo returned to Japan anxious to rejoin Ayako and their young son and daughter, Yoshi and Yuriko. As a ship pulled into port into home, Nabuo gazed through binoculars to mask his tears. In 1945, Japan surrendered to the United States and its allies, ending World War II. Nabuo opened a hardware store and lived quietly in a Tokyo suburb. He never discussed his Oregon raids, though they were clearly never clearly out of his mind. And the residents of Brookings largely forgot about their close call until 1962. The author here is showing us a little more about Nabuo. Okay? 
think about it. He sounds a lot like American dads, doesn't he? He had a business. You know, he, he went about life there. And he never forgot, though, about what he had done. So something's fixing to happen in 1962. The year that Brookings JCs, a leadership organization, was looking for a way to boost tourism to their sleepy burg. Now tourism is when people go to visit towns because of an attraction that they have there or maybe an event that they have there. So one member had this bold idea. He suggested that they track down the Japanese bomber pilot and invite him to attend their annual Memorial Day Festival as a guest of honor. So they did. Wouldn't that be something? Here somebody was that had bombed them years ago and yet they invite him to come and visit their town as a guest of honor. That's a pretty important title. To their surprise, Nabuo accepted their invitation. And they weren't the only ones who were shocked. This was the first Nabuo's family had ever heard of what he had done in America. Isn't that something? All those years and he's never told his family what happened. One U.S. newspaper published a petition condemning the idea. So some people didn't like it, did they? Those who signed felt that any soldier saluted in Brooklyn, Brookings should be American. Furthermore, it would be expensive to fly over Nabuo, Ayako, and Yoshi, now 26, who would act as translators. Despite the pressure to cancel the visit, the JCs didn't give in. Welcoming Nabuo, they announced, would be a symbol of reconciliation, not just between individuals, but nations as well. I wonder why they thought it was so important for them to have a reconciliation between nations. Another newspaper printed a letter from a veteran who wrote, he was doing a job and we were doing a job. Other veterans, including the governor of Oregon and President John F. Kennedy, also praised the invitation. Protesters began to open their minds. You know, it can be really hard for enemies to reconcile after a war. You know, it's really hard to, you know, come together and make friendships with people that you've been, uh, you know, showing hate towards. Um, but think about the story, just like we read on Monday, um, shooting at the stars. The people came together. What do you think it made it easier for the Americans to reconcile? Why was it easier for them to reconcile? or make people or realize that they needed to be friends with them. Why do you think some people didn't think it was a good idea and wanted to protest? Nabuo was very nervous. Initially, he had feared that the Americans were tricking him into coming so they could put him on trial as a war criminal. He worried that they would insult him, egg him, beat him, but he knew he had to go no matter what. It would be impolite to refuse, he said. Again, he brought his family sword. This time, however, it was not for luck. Over the years, Nabura's war pride had shriveled into guilt. His brother had been lost in battle. His country had suffered, suffered catastrophically, catastrophically when the United States dropped atomic bombs on the city of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And though his bombings hadn't hurt anyone, that had been the intention. If the people of Brookings accepted the apology he had planned, he would get the sword to the town. If they did not, he would use the sword to commit seppuka, a traditional Japanese suicide by a person overcome with shame. All right. How do you think that changes your opinion of Nabuo, knowing that he was willing to die for regaining friendship with the Americans? Sort of makes you realize that he really is a good person, isn't he? Just a man doing his job is what the other soldier said. A large group of people awaited his arrival at the airport. To his relief, they greeted him and his family, not with anger, but with warmth. Gesturing to the jetliner he had flown in, Nabuo said in good spirit, It's a little larger than the plane in which I made my first trip. During the festival parade, an official introduced the fajitos who bowed three times to the applauding pl crowd. Nabuo shook the hand of a six-year-old boy who said he wished to visit Japan. 
right? What a nice gesture to have not only just a, a ceremony, but it was a parade of people meeting him at the airport. Wow. At a banquet in Nobuo's honor, they had a banquet for him. Nobuo and Yoshi, Yoshi handed over the sword, which the library would display. I never imagined I could be back in Japan alive after my flight over America, Nobuo said softly, and I never dreamed I could visit the United States again. Do you think the Americans accepted his apology? I think they did too. They accepted the sword and they hung it in their library, it said. Later, Nobuo met one of the men who had, put, who had put out his fire. You're one of the worst firefighter, fire setters in the world, the man said. If you're going to set another fire, do the same good job. Do you think he might have been picking fun, making a little bit of fun of Mr. Nobuo? I think so, too. He told him he was the worst fire setter ever. A local pilot flew Nobuo over the wilderness he had bombed, and he let him take controls for a short while. Wow, that was a really nice gesture for somebody to let him ride, uh, uh, not only ride in their plane, but he let him fly the plane, too. Before leaving America, Nabuo said that he would like to host Brookins' residence in Japan one day, so he's invited some Americans to come back and visit them. That day came 23 years later. At Nabuo's expense, three Brookings, Brookings High School students traveled to Japan. Accompanying them was the now grown boy from the 1962 parade. Remember, we showed a picture a minute ago of that. For a week, Nabuo turned toward his guest around his country. Their goodbyes were awash with emotion. The war is finally over for me, Nabuo said. Nabuo made three more trips back to Brookings. At a party in 1990, he was served a large submarine sandwich topped with a plane made of sliced pickles and a half olive helmet. Nabuo did not speak English, but everyone understood his reaction. He thought that was pretty funny to get a submarine sandwich. In 1992, one day ahead of the 50th anniversary of his first bombing, he planted a tree seating at the bomb site. In 1995, a pilot again flew him over the forest and gave him a brief chance to fly, fly the plane himself. Nabuo donated thousands of dollars to the town, especially so the library could buy children's books that celebrate other cultures. He wondered if World War II would have been different had his generation grown up reading books like those. In 1997, Brookins got word that Nabuo was not well. Urgently, a town representative flew to Tokyo to tell Nabuo in person that, Brook, uh, that Brookins had made him an honorary citizen precisely 55 years after his second bombing. The next day, at 85 and at peace, Nabuo passed away. Here's his family. The following year, as Nabuo had requested, Eureka sprinkled some of his ashes over the bomb site. A flutist played a solo combining the national anthems of Japan and America. At the time of his death, Nabuo was the only person who had bombed the United States mainland from a plane. He spent much of his life hoping no one would ever take that title from him. You know, I love that last sentence because... A lot of times we hear something ambiguous like that and we think that maybe Nabura was proud of what he did and that's why he didn't want anybody to take the title from him. But not in this case. I think he uh, said that or felt that way because he never wanted anybody else to carry that guilt and shame that he had for bombing the United States like he did. So I thought that was a great statement for him to make. Okay, on Google Classroom, there's a question posed for you there. And it says, why do you think this reconciliation was so important for everyone involved? I want you to write your thoughts and opinions in the reader's notebook there. Okay, again, why do you think reconciliation? And reconciliation, remember, means to mend a friendship. 
that's been broken, okay? And think about that because, you know, before the war, um, Japan and the United States were not enemies, and then they became enemies, and they had to find a way to come back together. So I want you to express your thoughts and opinions about that in your uh, reading section of your binder. That should be in your three-ring binder, okay?